Hello there, and thank you for joining me for part 6 for the uh, Marconi 6200A uh, radio test set repair, microwave radio test set. Um, this is the uh, what we're referencing in part 5, um, the what is the um, pick off, the diode pick off. Um, if you remember in part 5 we were looking at the description and the technical description in the Marconi manual about how it limits the um, RF level and uh, I've been into this in part 5 we had a look a close up look um, we actually thought that the um, this part here this socket that was a pin in the middle it isn't it's actually the whole pin is that and uh, then we had this tiny little grain of rice there you can see it might be able to see down there that's the diode and we've got the the print coming in um, from the RF in and then we have some resistance material going that way to ground some more resistance material going that way to ground and then we have another piece of resistance material and a bond wire connecting to the top of that diode and then the other side of the diode, which is on that plate, which is uh, an insulator underneath it, it's like a compound insulator. So there's some bond wires that connect to here, and that then connects obviously soldered to the inner of this RF connector. Now, there isn't any diode properties between this piece of print here and this island here. So that is a diode, obviously. Um, there's a capacitance material underneath here to provide a capacitor. So it gives a smooth DC output. But uh, I think the bond wire has gone between the resistance material and that little tiny diode. And when we looked at it under the microscope, it looked pretty bad, actually. It looks like as if I think somebody's put some RF power up it high amount of RF back into the test set or DC voltage and it's uh, it's damaged it so let's look again with the uh, magnifier and let's see what we can see so if I can just try and get a bit more light on it that might be a good idea very difficult using these uh, magnifiers to try and get any any form of uh, let's see if I can get this magnifier to work in that sense so that little tiny black dot that you can see right in the middle of the picture there that's the diode and it's very difficult to see. I'm sorry about the lighting conditions. It's a shocking uh, thing. You can see the bond wire going off to the, the pad. But then there's a bond wire that's meant to go from... If you look right in the middle of that trace that comes from the right, there's a piece of black resistance material in the horizontal plane which then goes to a, a gold track. Um, and there's meant to be a bond wire that leaps from that gold track to the top of that black square which is a diode and that's missing I've looked at it under a microscope and it's incredibly difficult to uh, to resolve under this condition um, so that's blown is that now I might be able to repair it but to give you an idea if I were to use a sewing needle as a demonstration against that black diode that you can see it would be like, if you imagine, um, if you imagine that as the diode, okay, that screw, and then I were to use a knitting, um, a knitting needle, a sewing needle, a finest sewing needle that you can get, it would be like that in size in comparison to it. It would literally be like that. It would be like using a crowbar to solder a grain of rice, basically. So that's how small we're dealing with in there. I mean, you can barely see it anyway, even when you zoom in, zoom in there. That tiny little, tiny little grain of rice that's right in the middle of the picture, down there, is 
is basically the uh, the diode and that's a maximum zoom on this camera that's how small we're dealing with fractions of a half a millimeter if that um, so anyway what I wanted to do was just talk about the architecture of this pick-off diode but before I do that because I don't think I'm going to be able to repair that um, this interestingly enough is the same as this but made by a different company and this is a, a, a wide band detector diode detector if you watch the video that I did about microwave goodness where I went through all the different microwave parts that I've got out of the box that I found there's a, a, a feature on this where I showed a few of these that I've got where there's an RF in and a DC detect output here so what I'm going to do, I'm going to try this anyway, assuming that this is in the same window for the DC margin uh, that's coming out that's acceptable to the controller to, to pick off the uh, DC level. Um, but anyway, it should be, you know, a diode's a diode at the end of the day, but um, this I need to test. We'll do in one of the videos after this, I'll characterise this across the whole frequency range um, from... 2 gigahertz to 20 gigahertz don't forget that this diode pick off isn't used in the alc circuit for frequencies between 10 megs to 2 gigahertz that's because the synthesizer block itself generates those frequencies and it has its own pin diode attenuator um, and so when i explain on the block diagram shortly you'll see that but uh, this is a, a good possibility being able to use that uh, assuming it's compatible with the frequencies that we're going to be using it over in the test set from uh, 2 gigs to 20 gigahertz, so I'll test that. But how this is designed um, is we have coming in, uh, we've got a uh, what appears to be obviously the SMA socket um, and the shell of the SMA, and that connects to what is the chassis of the outer casing uh, this then gets soldered onto um, like a glass substrate if you like which is this white ceramic glass substance there when then on it there's some resistance material which I've measured uh, and basically we've got a resistor then going to uh, what is chassis again or ground and then we've off it another resistor which then goes again to chassis this way and then off that going towards a diode assembly we've got another resistor here and that then goes to like a, a land which we, we saw now that resistor and this resistor added together makes between there and chassis uh, 50R, 50 ohms, and I think, I'm not right sure, I think I measured that as a 67 ohm resistor, that there, but uh, basically what comes off then is a bond wire from that to this little tiny black grain of rice, which is obviously the diode, and then underneath that diode, it's sat on like a, a wafer, uh, which is the opposite side of the diode. So in other words, for symbology reasons, it's like that, basically. So this bit here is the bond wire connection, uh, the anode, and the cathode is obviously the plate underneath that it's sat on. So then we've got two bond wires, which then go to um, another piece of metal, gold plate and metal, and we have two bond wires here and they basically go straight across to there like that and they're bonded onto here and then we have a center of the SMA socket or the the other socket the MCX socket soldered to it and then obviously the shell of the MCX connects to ground now when we look at this um, part here which is is this um, section this gold um, piece here that part 
that itself is sandwiched if we look at it in the horizontal plane rather than vertical at the moment if we take that to one side with if we're looking at this here on its side plane horizontal plane we've got the piece of metal here like that then we have the if you like the the chassis the box that it's sat in if you like uh, which is excuse my drawing and then we've got some capacitance material and insulating material but it's also a capacitance material so in effect electrically it's actually a capacitor basically so from a circuit point of view uh, we've obviously got uh, if we were to look at it electrically uh, we've got basically a, a 50 ohm down to ground or the case because this is obviously chassis ground um, then we've got another resistor to a diode and then we have a capacitor in effect again down to chassis and then that then goes out then to what is the MCX connector which is then a DC output and so this is obviously the frequency in or RF in from 2 gigahertz to 20 gigs input and that's basically how it works now the other um, part which is this um, attenuator here when we looked at that the RF attenuator uh, that had if we remember it was a, a choke it was a choke that we saw then it went there was a, an RF line and then there was a, uh, a pin diode, or what I thought were two pin diodes, one there and one here. And then we had the RF in, so that's the RF in. And then we had the RF out, and that was the output. But just coming off that, we had a, another trace going off to what was another socket, which went then to this diode coupler here. Um, so these two were effectively joined together and so RF coming in um, basically we had uh, if that's the correct way to draw it and then I think uh, we had it if I remember rightly I think it went that way around so we had the pin diodes and then we had what is your RF in and your RF out and this then was the DC control. Okay, so RF comes in at a fixed level. So this is um, an RF signal that's coming in, uh, probably plus uh, 30 dBm uh, or whatever level's coming in, and then the DC voltage onto. Um, onto the diodes then we'll we'll control that i think there's a capacitance a blocking capacitor as well in there which i need to draw in uh, to prevent dc bias from going out on both these sockets uh, so the dc potential comes in the control voltage this is a radio frequency choke or an rsc um, there'll probably be another capacitor up here as well um, which will then go to the, the chassis as well as part of it um, and there may also be on the outputs of these diodes to get them to bias there's probably another RSC to ground as well chassis which I can't see um, with the level of magnification that I've got available because these are fractions of millimetres in, in all cases um, and so there's a coil there probably in a coil here so there's a, a, a DC path through the pin diodes obviously to, to ground in order to provide the RF path through and if you look at how pin diodes work anyway the switches they often work in this arrangement where transmit path or transmit signal can only go through if there's a flow of DC current to ground through the diode it's not just a case of applying um, bias so in other words you couldn't do this for example you couldn't have um, something like that 
and then that's obviously a DC control because if that went to a blocking capacitor and then to an RF socket for example uh, and you had an RF input you wouldn't get any RF going through until you introduced another uh, an RFC choke or a resistor uh, potentially as well that's another way of doing it a resistor to then to ground so that there's a, a DC current flow going through in that direction um, so that naturally it would have a path through the diode and then present a, a path for the RF as well so that's just a little rundown anyway of this diode um, uh, this diode pick off um, now if we go back to the diagram we talked about this only being used in the um, 2 to uh, 20 gigahertz frequency range and the reason for that is is because the um, the diode pick off which is this that we've just been looking at um, the signals generated from the 10 megs to 2 gigahertz range are not coming from the tuned oscillators they're actually coming from the synthesizer block okay uh, which is this big can here that I've taken out so basically what happens is is that it's got its own pin diode attenuator within the within the unit the synthesizer unit here and uh, basically the um there's a switch and i think what isn't shown in this diagram because it's obviously a basic block diagram is i think there'll be a after the amp there'll be a, a detector feedback here going back into this circuit so it keeps it in a loop but as you can see there's a levelling amp here that's the DAC control if you remember in the previous videos we were looking at the DAC value within the um, uh, diagnostics menu so the DAC then controls obviously the DC level to the pin diode uh, from two from 10 megahertz sorry to 2 gigahertz and that obviously has then a its own independent output which then goes into the pin switch and then makes its way through to the output and this obviously isn't used for any feedback uh, between 10 megahertz and, and 2 gigahertz because that's done here within this own variable attenuator within the synthesizer and then goes through an amplifier and obviously out that way so it's got its own integral ALC obviously above 2 gigahertz which is when it uses one of the YIGs to then start sending the signal out then that's when this comes into its own um so yes quite interesting um so i think obviously um the idea behind it is that by using this instead this may get us out of a boatload of trouble the only other thing i can do is to purchase a very high frequency switching diode that um, I can then solder directly onto that module. Now, potentially that's another another repair where we can uh, buy a diode basically that can solder onto that tiny little uh, island, which would be quite an achievement in itself. After the resistor, and then connect it straight to this. Uh, light island here solder it on um, and there are some shocky diodes that do go up to that frequency that I can use in that example but again it all comes down to this at the end of the day if I use this diode pick off as an, or even a, put a replacement diode in here that I can physically solder myself um, is that it's the window so this DC window um, is what is important because if we say that's zero volt and that's, I don't know, plus three volts for example, if a diode characteristics that are chosen don't match that, um, this has got a window where, for example, a DAC value might be, that might be zero and this might be, I don't know, uh, nine, nine, nine. 99 in the DAC value 
and everything in between obviously is between these DAT values and if this can't produce a high enough output voltage say for example it, it can only go to here for whatever reason because it's, it's design because this might be used in a in a, obviously designed for a different application if the DAT controller needs to take the voltage above that to represent the level coming out if it's above the window for the this operational margins then it won't be able to calibrate and then it won't work we'll still be in the same boat that we are now but if it does work under the same rough um, pretense as this then it would work providing it can match the same frequency bandwidth which we're going to test next but the only other thing to do of course is to buy a diode that will solder across and I'll be in the same boat again, not knowing if that diode characteristic is similar to the one that's already used and thus the window being the same. I have seen spares of these um, knocking about, but they're very expensive, you know. As a matter of fact, uh, one of these replacements was more than buying a second-hand Marconi 6200A anyway. So, you know, it's, it's worth doing their own repair. The other thing I can do as well, if I get it back under the microscope again and I use a... A very thin needle tip and I have done something like this before is that if you've got the diode uh, on that wafer there's like a little on one side of it there's like a little silver island to solder to for the bond wires to bond to and sometimes if you put some insulating tape here um, to prevent solder from getting onto that because we're only talking microns the the island on the glass substrate is here and then obviously we've got the resistor material there you can actually put a providing this is insulated with some of that heat tape insulated tape you can put a solder blob across and I have done repairs like that before bit of a budget and scarper job but it does work I mean we're only talking here a fraction of one millimeter so just a solder blob across instead of the bond wire that's broken because that bond wire is broken at the moment. So I think what's caused that fault, interestingly enough, is that and this is why you've got to be careful with microwave test sets. Um, the RF input here, uh, output rather, it does have the capability to have some reverse power put up it, but not a lot. But in a lot of situations as well, when you're using bias T's, for example, to supply a DC power, um, if you watch the microwave goodness video, we used a bias, we looked at a bias T where we have a, a DC potential coming in and that then feeds its way through to the output and the input's got a blocking capacitor so DC can't leave the input. So we're feeding a signal in and then coming out we've got a DC bias plus the RF signal coming out. The problem with that is, is if you get those the wrong way around and you feed volts back up the test set in other words, up the centre there, or something goes horribly wrong in the circuit you're designing, or um, there's a high amount of RF power put back, could be from a radar transmitter pulse of high energy pulse goes back. Because there's no blocking capacity, if you like, between the um, RF input and obviously all the subsequent modules inside, in effect, I think what you can get is a, a pulse of high energy RF or DC fed back which would ultimately melt this bond wire uh, we have two bond wires here so they're going to take a higher current than one single bond wire um, this resistor is quite a low value in comparison to a gold bond wire uh, potentially um, and it will zap that wire depending on the amount of energy coming up and if it's as I say a quick pulse it, it could be enough to take that out so this fault could have been caused by someone being careless and connecting a supply voltage inadvertently 40 odd volts or whatever up there because a lot of microwave outdoor units that are used in microwave links use about 40 volts up the um, coax to the uh, masthead amplifier system and it's dead easy to get that wrong and connect it there or alternatively a high amount of RF energy has been reversed back into the test set and thus stuffed this uh, diode module so there's a potential still to repair. I'm not going to, um, you know, diminish that. I'm going to, I'm going to have a look at that further under the microscope. But when you consider that is 
you know, that size, even under a microscope. And a sewing needle is like that in comparison in size. Then you can see the challenges of trying to solder on that anyway. I mean, the soldering iron tip that I've got on my um, paste soldering iron is like is like um, putting two hands together over a grain of rice in the size differences. So you can imagine that. Anyway, uh, join me for the next video where we'll be looking at characterising this to see whether this might be a suitable replacement for that. Indeed, I've got a few of these. I might take one apart and see if a diode in here is removable um, and then put it in there because the next thing I've got is this is an SMA and that's I think it's an MCX. So I've got a I have got some adapters and I've got some cables with these connectors and I'd have to rig something up to transform from an SMA to one of these to plug it back in the test set because obviously the cable for the test set connects to that gender of connector, not this. So there's a few options to look at yet and uh, possible repairs. So I'll get back to you in the next part. Thank you very much for watching the video and see you in the next one.